Well, good evening. Uh, as you can tell, I am not Dr. Mark, but I am glad to be here with you guys tonight. I'll just go ahead and say it. Uh, he will be here Sunday. So I know some of y'all are going to call the office and say, is Dr. Mark going to preach Sunday? Yes, it's okay. He'll be back. Uh, we had talked um, about, I was, this is my first time to be able to come and, and uh, teach for Wednesday night and share with you guys, which is awesome. Uh, I was supposed to about a month ago and Dr. Mark was supposed to be out of town and, uh, and ended up not going out of town. And so, uh, so he would call, he'd call me the like, night before and was like, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and teach tomorrow. And I was like, all right, <laughs> I got benched. Um, but uh, he, he, uh, he talked to me um, about my outline and, and what I'll be going through tonight. And he was like, oh, that's perfect because we're going through a brand new series and teaching through uh, the Old Testament, teaching through the scriptures, teaching through the Hebrew, uh, from, especially from the Hebrew perspective of the Bible and uh, why that's important because it really sets a, a framework and a perspective of how we as non-Jewish 21st century people understand the scripture that we read. Um, you know, it's important to know the framework that you're working in. One of the things that I love, um, by the way, uh, thank you guys. Uh, scripture tells us that we are supposed to um, sing all kinds of spiritual songs and hymns to one another. Um, which is interesting because most of the time when we think about worship, we think of about a, a vertical nature of worship, right? We think about we are singing to God. But scripture also says that we sing these songs to each other to encourage each other. And I absolutely love what just happened in this room and has happened, been happening for months is every once in a while, I just won't sing and I just listen to you guys sing around me. And it is awesome and it is so encouraging. And I hope that your hearts are encouraged by each other. Um, so I just wanted to say that for a second. Another thing that I love is uh, fantasy football. And um, yeah, yeah, I know. So some of y'all, I'll explain this to you. So fantasy football is where uh, you draft, you get together with a bunch of your buddies and you draft a football team uh, like in the virtual world on just on paper. And, uh, and real life NFL players play football and then you get points for whatever they do on the field, right? So that's kind of how this works. And uh, it's a blast, I love it. Uh, I tell people all the time that fantasy football saved my relationship with my brother. Uh, in 2003, my brother had moved out uh, when he graduated high school for about four years. We saw each other on like holidays, but it was before cell phones and texting. And, and so like, I just didn't see him and he called me up my freshman year of college and was like, I need one more person, our draft is tonight. I need you to draft and play fantasy football. And since then we've talked to each other like, three, four, five times a week. Uh, and so it's a lot of fun. It's really cool. If you're into stats and stuff, it's really cool. If you're just into watching football, it's really cool. Uh, so we started a fantasy football league for uh, our kids. So I have four kids, um, three of them play in the league because one of them is two years old. And uh, so the other three play and he's got three kids that are the same age. And so we started a fantasy football league just for them for fun. And, um, and so my, my third uh, my third kid, uh, Arbor, her birthday was yesterday. She just turned seven and she is the sweetest little girl in the world. I love her to death. She, uh, Sunday was like, we were watching football and she's like, dad, when are we going to watch our fantasy football? And I was like, baby, we, we are, we're watching football. And she's like, no, no, no. But like, when am I going to watch my team play? And I was like, hold on, babe, let me explain to you how fantasy football works. Like you drafted real people on all these different teams and they do real life stuff and then you get points. And she was like, oh, she won the league last year, by the way. So I didn't feel bad. Um, but she understood now that like you got to watch real life games and figure out who your player is to know if you're getting points. And so she started to learn a little bit about the structure and the background of fantasy football. So now she has a better understanding of what it really is. When we look at the Old Testament, it's the same exact thing. And it's a silly analogy for us, but it's the same exact thing. When we start to look at the truth about the Old Testament and about the, the Hebrew uh, nature of the scriptures, even the, even the New Testament, and we start to look at how they were written, when they were written, who they were written by. I know Dr. Mark talked to y'all last week and told you, look, Luke is the only author of the Bible that was not Hebrew. Right, So it was very much so the scriptures that we have are from a Hebrew perspective, from a Jewish perspective. And, um, and so we have adopted that. But the more that we understand the culture, the nature of the scriptures, how they're structured, how they're written, the, the better off we are going to be 
in understanding um, what it looks like for us to read the scripture with a, a good framework, a proper framework. So we're not asking, when do I watch my fantasy team? But we understand the nature of what we're reading. I don't know if y'all got outlines. Uh, I wrote outlines. Good, good, good. So I did an outline for you guys tonight. Um, and it says covenant theology. And so um, and it's a little bit more uh, specific new covenant theology. Uh, but the reason I want to talk about this and why Dr. Mark was excited about this, because we're, we're going to kind of set a framework for hopefully how you'll see scripture and, and how you'll see it progress um, through the Old Testament into the New Testament and then what it looks like for us. Um, I want to read a one, just one verse to you tonight. I'm going to start with a verse and then I'm going to finish uh, the rest of that passage at the very end. But it's in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. This isn't on your sheet, so write it down. Jer Jeremiah 31, 30. And it says... This. this is the prophet. He says, Behold, days are coming. It is a declaration of God, of Adonai. And he says this. This is what God says. He says, When I will make, the, the days are coming, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So we're going to look at, there is a day, there is a promise. Israel, since the time of Jeremiah the prophet, has been looking forward to this new covenant. Right? This was what they were looking for. This is what they had anticipated. This was everything. That there would be a new covenant that will come into place. So in order to understand how our Bible's set up, right? We have an Old Testament and a New Testament. I think most of y'all know that. 66 books total. We have an Old Testament and a New Testament. The word testament is Latin. It comes from the Latin word covenant. So you can actually look at your entire scripture and just read it as Old Covenant, New Covenant. Right, just right there is it's just a little small shift that makes a big difference. But that's what the word actually means is testament means covenant. So we have the Old Testament, the Old Covenants, and then we have the New Testament, which is the New Covenants. Um, but to understand an Old Testament covenant, you have to understand where this developed from. So uh, we can even go back and we can look at Hebrew uh, culture and context. And, and what you figure out real quickly is that just like uh, the United States of America doesn't exist in a bubble, that we, we have interaction with other nations, right? We have interaction with other cultures. South Louisiana is, we are a culture <laughs> to our own, right? But we have to interact with North Louisiana sometimes, which is a completely different culture. Um, we also uh, inter we interact with Texas and Mississippi, and a lot of us like to drive to the beach and go to Florida, and sometimes you drive to the mountains, and you deal with different even subcultures even in our own nation. Well, Israel dealt with these different cultures of the nations that surrounded them, and they adopted a lot of the same, uh, the same structures and frameworks, the first one being a covenant. So there's something that's called a, a suzerain or a vassal treaty, and that's where we get the framework for the covenants in the Bible. It's a suzerain or a, a, a vassal treaty, uh, and what that means is there's basically there's, um, I have it A through F, uh, of the points on there, and, and we're going to go through what that looks like. But basically, when a nation would invade a different nation, the king of the, the victorious nation would typically make a vassal treaty, or sometimes uh, before they went to war, that was preferable, right? You would uh, siege the city, you would surround the city, you would cut off the water and food supply, you would try to starve them out, make them really uncomfortable until they surrendered because they couldn't overwhelm your forces, and then you would make this treaty with them. And so there was a vassal, which is the weaker party, and then there's this, uh, the suzerain who was the stronger party. Point A, um, the preamble of this, this um, co the, 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 the covenants that were made, and they were usually written out, was that they would have a preamble, and it would identify who the, the dominant party was of the covenant. If you look in Scripture, you'll see that this pattern is, is followed for every single Old Testament covenant. And what we see is that God is always the dominant party. So when God deals with Israel and when God deals with us, he's always the dominant party. A lot of times we don't treat it that way. I don't know if you have ever prayed the prayer that's like, God, if you do this for me, then I will go ahead and make this deal with you, right? Like how many of y'all have ever prayed that prayer before? Nobody wanted to raise their hand, but yes, we make deals. We got, 
That's not how this, this covenant process works. It identifies the dominant party. There was also a historical prologue that would recount the previous relationship between the two parties. So there was kind of a, a, a little historical narrative. This is who God is. This is who the, 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 the dominant party is. This is who the vassal party is. And, and this is how they have interacted in the past. Um, you then see that a covenant has stipulations that the vassal must agree to. So typically you would have you know, a certain amount of uh, either goods, so whether it was grain or whatever your primary export was, Lebanon was known for their cedars. So when Lebanon, Lebanon would be um, taken over, the part of the treaty that they would have to is you would have to export your trees to them, to the, the suzerain for free, right? Or maybe it was grain, or maybe it was gold, maybe it was silver, but whatever. A lot of times Egypt was known for the chariots, and if Egypt had been conquered, they would have to export chariots to the dominant party. Um, And then you would have uh, provisions for periodic reading and safekeeping. So they would file these uh, treaties, and they would typically file them in uh, whatever temple of the gods that they worshiped. So if it was Babylon, they would, you know, they would... um, put them in the temples of their gods. If it was the Canaanites, they would put them in the temple of their gods. You see that in scripture. Uh, when the Ark of the Covenant is stolen, right, they take that and they put it into the temple of Dagon. And uh, that's a really cool story. You should just go, go Google that one or search it in your scriptures. Uh, it's really cool of what happens and then um, how they uh, like just take, take it back because God defeated us and y'all weren't even around. Um, Next, there's a witness of the covenant. And then finally, uh, there's blessings and curses should the vassal either keep or break the covenant. So there were um, blessings if you kept the covenant, if you were the vassal. So God comes to make a covenant with you. If you keep the covenant, then there are blessings. If you break the covenant, then there are curses. And so this is the structure of every Um, every treaty that was made in the Near East, and that translates over to what we see through Scripture of how God approaches the nation of Israel. He would come and he would initiate uh, these covenants because God was the suzerain. Um, The suzerain provided certain things. Typically, it was military protection or uh, land or familial rights. So they would adopt you a lot of times into their family. Um, and so you would become, this, was, this wasn't just for conquering nations, but this is a lot of times what happened in marriage covenants. So you would make a covenant, and a young man would go, and he would go to uh, the, the, the leader of the family, and he would ask for a wife, and the, the father would see if this was you know, a good match. He would see if this is a good, responsible young man. You see this with... Um, uh, with Jacob, when he goes to get his wife and he ends up with, uh, he ends up getting tricked <laughs> with Leah and then he has to work for Rachel for seven more years, right? You see this kind of, this idea, but what happened is you would get adopted into the family. And so you would go and you would ask for, uh, the hand in marriage. And then that father would actually give you the privilege of representing their family. So you would have all rights, all authority, all legal, uh, ability that, that, Uh, family had. So you had access to all their property, all their wealth, all of their goods. You represented the family. You became a son. Um, And so that is what the dominant party usually gave. And then the vassal usually gave some sort of um, financial tribute or uh, consummate tribute. So they would, again, they would provide goods, they would provide labor. Um, For us, when we look at this relationship that we have with God, it's very unique because When you look at the suzerain, which is God, he provides the power for us. And our role is to provide the praise to him. He provides the power, the Holy Spirit, right? The power that rose Jesus from the grave comes. And I know classic misconception, right? People say, oh, you just got to pray to receive Jesus in your heart. Like Jesus doesn't come live in your heart. We are filled with the Holy Spirit that comes and indwells us is what scripture tells us. The very power, the same power, Paul says, that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, also resides in you, and he seals us as a guarantee. I'm getting ahead of myself and a little bit into the new covenant, so we're going there. But he seals us as a guarantee until the day that God establishes his kingdom, right? So we are sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then we, therefore, give praise to God as us, the vassals. We give God praise. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, the whole scripture is divined, 
by covenant theology. We can see throughout scripture from the very beginning all the way to the very end that there are these series of covenants that happen. Um, You may have heard the phrase that there's a scarlet thread that runs through the Bible. There's a scarlet thread that runs through the Bible. There's a reason that that phrase exists and, and kind of break that down a little bit. Covenants are always sealed by blood. So covenants were always sealed by blood. And there is, from the very beginning, there's shedding of blood. And every single covenant that God makes, there's shedding of blood. And it culminates in Christ and his shed blood on the cross. And so when we look, we can see that this this pattern continues all throughout Scripture. So there are six key aspects um, of God's divine covenants in the Bible. So God initiates divine covenants. We're never, I I think I mentioned that a a second ago, we are never allowed to initiate a covenant because we are the vassal. God always initiates covenants with us. You're going to see that through the covenants that we talk about. Um, It's true of us today, right? It says, how could anyone come unless the Father draws them, right? God initiates a covenant with you. And that is how we have relationship with God because he always initiates the covenant. Um, God's divine covenants bring a binding relationship there. It's a binding relationship. It is a relationship that is, um, we have a very, and you guys know this, we have a very watered down version of marriage in our culture, in our society. It's really sad. Statistically about 50% of marriages end. Um, and even worse, the divorce rate in the church is actually higher than it is outside of the church. So the divorce rate in the church is actually higher, and there's all kind of reasons for that because a lot of people don't get married outside the church, and they just live together and they leave. Um, But the idea of a binding relationship, what's supposed to be the most binding covenant that we have, that we make for us, we don't have a very clear or strong understanding of what an, a completely binding relationship is. Now, a lot of you guys do, and you understand that, and you know that, and you know what it, what it means when things are difficult that you stay. Uh, you know what it means to persevere. Um, but what we see is that God makes a binding relationship with us, which is supported in Scripture, not just through the Old Testament covenants, but also, again, New Testament covenant is that we are sealed, guaranteed by the Holy Spirit until the day that he returns. We are sealed, it's a guarantee. It's an, it is a, an unbinding, unbreakable covenant that God establishes with us. Uh, divine covenants are a living relationship. Um, divine covenants, we don't have a covenant. Paul covers this a lot in the New Testament. He says, look, we don't worship worthless idols. We don't worship stones and, and images of gold and silver and precious stone. We worship a living God. Our covenant with God is always breathing life. Your covenant with God, if you are in this covenant relationship and you're spending time with God, you're filled with life. That's why it's so important to stay connected to the source, right? That's why we read scripture. It's why we come and we show up for Bible studies and we come to church and we worship together because it breathes life back into us as followers of Christ. So we see those, that living relationship. And then we also see a unique relationship because again, God has adopted us as his sons and daughters. He brings us, he gives us those familial rights. And the Bible tells us that while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. That while we hated him, while we were lost in our sin, Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice, which was his life. Um, Divine covenants are also, uh, they come with blessings and obligations. Uh, A lot of times we like to skip over this part now, um, that we have obligations to Christ, right? That we have obligations in our faith. Um, It's really easy to say, oh, just come to Christ and, you know, um, and, and that's it. And, but we do have obligations as followers of Jesus that we are supposed to uphold our end of this bargain. Now, again, the covenant is binding and it is secure. If we don't uphold our obligations, spoiler alert, you're not able to. Um, Israel found that out. You will find that out quickly. Uh, If you have not found that out, um, you may want to pray about pride. Um, (laughs) 
because none of us are able to uphold these, which is why we have somebody that has upheld these for us. But we do have things that we are called to do, right? Jesus has given us specifically as his followers commandments, right? That we would love him. That true love is that we obey his commands. That we would go out, that we would um, fail not to assemble together. That we would make disciples in all the nations. That we would love our neighbor as ourself. That we would have uh, mercy and grace toward others that we would turn the other cheek. Like we have a mission. We're not saved just to sit, right? We are saved to go out and to work. That is part of, that is our leg of this covenant, right? We are called to do certain things. We bring him praise. We bring him honor. We give, we see that in Acts, right? People gave, they sold their land. They sold their property. They gave sacrificially. So that when we want to take care of the poor, we want to provide for those that need, we want ministry to grow. That's all part of our obligations in the covenant, but it comes with blessings. And those are the blessings that Paul talks about that we will have love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, right? The fruit of the spirit. Those are the blessings that we receive. Now, look, there are going to be some of y'all that will receive blessings that are going to be monetary, right? And some people do receive those types of blessings. And, and God specifically in scripture, it's only one of the few times he, he says, test me on this, but it's when it comes to giving. He says, look, you give the tithe and see that I don't bless you. Test me on this. Just try to outgive me. And God says, you can't do it. You won't do it. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I own everything and I will not let you go without, right? So there is financial blessing. There is blessing of health. It does not mean that every single one of us is going to live a tip-top, top-notch, healthy lifestyle or have, a health, have all the, the blessings of health. Some people live a healthy lifestyle and they still don't have perfect health. That's just not the blessing that we have, but we do have blessing, right? We have blessings in the family that we're surrounded with. Um, that is one of the blessings that God gives us. We have financial blessing. We have family blessing. We have the blessing that is the church that God has given to us universally as part of his promise in this covenant that he would give us when family leaves, he gives us a new family. When health fails, he gives us sustenance. He sustains us. When our faith is challenged and we are weak, he brings us through that with perseverance. And that perseverance produces character in us. So these are the things that God also has defined as his end of the bargain that he gives us. Um, the last point, and this is where really the key comes in, is that violated, defined, di sorry, violated divine covenants result in death. Violated divine covenants result in death in death. That is you. That is me. That is what we have deserved. That is the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. So, um, God is always true to his word. Uh, God never breaks his word. God has designed a system where a covenant that is violated ends in death. It has to be paid for in blood. So where does that leave us? It's a great question <laughs> because we've all violated God's covenant that he has established with us. But God in his infinite mercy and grace and love has done something that is completely unjust. And it's that he has paid for the sacrifice himself. This is where the covenant that God establishes breaks with the tradition of the Old Testament uh, suzerain covenants. The, the, the vassal king, if you go through scripture, anytime the vassal king breaks the covenant, um, they're reinvaded, they're taken over, they're taken into exile, they're humiliated, they're executed, their people are taken. Uh, you see that Israel is taken into Babylon, Israel is taken into exile. Um, we see that truth but for us, it's, it's different because God said, I will pay the covenant. 
I will pay the death penalty, the blood price. If you've ever seen uh, Pirates of the Caribbean where uh, Jack Sparrow steals the golden medallion, right? And, uh, or, or before that, when, um, when uh, Captain Barbosa wants to shed the blood of uh, Miss Elizabeth and he, he just cuts her hand a little bit. And he's like, yeah, it's all it took was the shedding of blood, right? And then the, you know, the curse isn't lifted and they go through the whole rest of the movie and the whole series and it's fun and it's awesome. But sometimes that's not the kind of shedding of blood that we're talking about. It's not like a, a blood brother pact. We see a covenant like that in the Old Testament. We see Jonathan and David make a covenant with one another. And uh, if you actually read through that covenant, um, that's what they do. They, they cut their hands and they make a blood pact with one another. It's a shedding of blood, but it's different because this is a mutual covenant that's made between David and uh, Jonathan. And in that, it's, it's really cool language where they say that th this is now binding. We are now eternally unseparatable. It's not a word, but I just used it. We're unseparatable. Thanks for the grace. <laughs> we, we cannot be separated. We are now forever bound together, which is the same language that we see Paul use about us in Christ, right? That we are forever unseparatable it's not a word. We can't be separated for, forever. Thank you. <laughs> um, we cannot be separated from Christ. Paul uses the same exact language. Paul, who is Hebrew, uses the same exact language that David and Jonathan use in their covenant as a throwback. It is a callback. Again, reading through, through the eyes of a Hebrew that would have heard this in the first century, they would have immediately thought back to that covenant. And they would have said, oh, yeah, it can't be broken. They are bound forever. We are bound forever with Christ. There is no walking away. There is no losing your salvation. There is no wiggle room here where this covenant can be altered, right? Because we don't have the power to alter the covenant. Only the one that's in power, the suzerain, God that established and initiated the covenant has the ability to alter it, and he does not. He has already paid the covenant. It is a blood covenant that is paid in death. The Bible uses uh, the word covenant five different ways, um, and it's really cool because when you look at the five different ways, they all apply to uh, how God approaches and treats us. The first one is this, fiz, um, the, the way or the means by which unique relationship is secured, right? The way or the means by which a unique relationship is secured. The Bible uses that action as, um, as the, the word covenant as that action the way that it's secured. When we look at it, the way that our covenant with God is secured is through Christ. It is not through us. It is not of our own doing, lest any should boast, but it is by grace alone through faith. Second, the relationship itself, which is secured by means of covenant making. The relationship itself is, is covenant. So it's an action, how a covenant is made. The Bible uses that word uh, to describe action. It describes the very nature we are in covenant. Um, we look at it, Summer and I, my wife, um, we get married, we'll be married uh, 12 years in November. And uh, when we got married, it was, uh, the covenant marriage was fairly new in Louisiana. We were like, yeah, let's do covenant marriage because anything that could express, the covenant marriage in Louisiana is a, um, you have to go through counseling before you get married and you cannot have a no fault divorce. So you can't just like down the road be like, eh, this isn't working out. Like, eh you grew, I grew, we grew apart. Let's just leave, right? Like that, that's not allowed. Somebody has to be declared at fault. And then you have to go through a certain time frame and a certain amount of counseling in order to actually get a divorce. Us, we went into the, to our marriage knowing like, Hey, this is just not an option. We like erase that from our dictionary, like cut that word out. It doesn't exist. We're not going to do it ever, no matter what. But we can express a, a higher commitment to each other, the highest level of commitment possible by having a covenant marriage in Louisiana. So we said, yes, let's do it, right? Because Summer and I are not in a, in a marriage in the cultural terms that we have, but we are in covenant with one another. Her and I, we are one. We exist as one. It's so cool when our kids, like we fight and our kids are like, you know, we all fight, right? Um, you, we fight and our kids are like, we hate when you fight. And we're like, yeah, we do too. We're not, sometimes we're like just debating something and they're like, don't fight. And we're like, we're not fighting. <laughs> and we have to, you know, go through that. But it's cool because we get to tell them like, hey, no, no, no. We are in a covenant relationship with each other. And we, like that is, they have friends that are divorced and it's understandable and I understand that. And things happen sometimes. And there are times Jesus does, again, give grace and mercy for, for why a relationship could and, and might possibly end. And he gives some room for that, right? Moses, 
uh, argues for that on the behalf of the Israelites. And Jesus says, yeah, look, we're going to give grace in all things. But for us, we get to tell our kids, like, no, 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 we have covenant. We are in a covenant relationship with one another. It's binding. It's eternal. It will not end, right? No matter how much Summer frustrates me right now, or more likely, how much David frustrates Summer right now, uh, we are in covenant together because it is, it is a noun. It is, we are in covenant. Um, see the signs and seals of the agreement or the relationship. So it's a re- representative or uh, confirmatory emblems. So they are objects or things. You wear a wedding ring, right? Uh, I'll never forget. Summer thought it was a, <laughs> it was a bad omen. I bought a tungsten ring because they're unbreakable, right? And uh, I'll never forget. I was walking from the old building into this building, and the fire doors were closed, and it was cold, and my hands shrink and swell summer to winter like crazy, right? So my, my awesome tungsten ring, uh, I was walking, and I was doing something, and I did this, and that ring flew off my hand, hit the ground, hit the fire doors, chipped, cracked, is broken. I still have it. I kept it. But she was like, is this a bad sign? I was like, I just wear a rubber one now all the time and I can change it out. Like right now it's gray. Tomorrow I might wear navy blue because it matches better. Um, But we have signs that show covenant, right? The rings don't marry us. They don't make us married, but they are a sign of the covenant that we are in. Uh, Written revelation related to a particular covenant. So sometimes covenant is defined as the definition. Uh, Written revelation related to a particular covenant. What is this about? This is kind of like if you would sign the marriage license, right? Like that is covenant. Um, And then E, the specific and particular administration of God's relationship with his people. This is where we can see what's written for us uh, in scripture. E, think of E is, is scripture to us, especially the New Testament, a uh, particular administration of God's relationship with his people. So what are the eight divine covenants of God? A lot of people will say there's seven. I like to include eight, kind of divide up the first one. Uh, the first one, A, is the Edenic uh, covenant. The Edenic covenant is the covenant of uh, Eden. So God creates Uh, Eden, and he puts Adam and Eve in Eden, and he gives a covenant with them, and the covenant is that they would rule, that we as human beings are designed to rule, to have dominion over all of the animals. Then the next covenant that comes into place is the Adamic covenant. The Adamic covenant, the covenant with Adam, because they broke the (laughs) Adamic covenant. Um, And so God has to make a new one. Uh, So once the, the covenant of rule and dominion is broken, then God sheds the blood of the animals because Adam and Eve did what they hid. God initiates the covenant. I'm not going to go through this with all of them, but this is like really overt stuff. Uh, God initiates the covenant. Adam and Eve are hiding in the garden. God comes. Why does God call? Because he's initiating covenant. It's not, he doesn't know where they are. He initiates covenant with them. He is the one that says, hey, I am calling to you. I am the authority. I am the suzerain. He doesn't use that language, but that's what he is. He is the Lord. He is God. He calls out to Adam and Eve. They are covered. They have covered them, their nakedness and their shame in fig leaves. And God slaughters, pays with blood for their sin and kills animals and makes clothes for them. And he establishes this new covenant. He says, hey, here's the rules. You can't stay in the garden anymore. You have to leave. Adam You're going to work the ground, and now when you work the ground, it is going to be a pain. If you have ever been out and tried to garden, or if you're a farmer, and it is hot, and we are in a drought, and you can't grow food, you can thank Adam, right? Because that's what happened. Work is hard and difficult for us because of this sin. Ladies, he says, I'm going to greatly increase the pain in childbearing, right? Like, so sorry, blame Eve. <laughs> there are consequences, and, but then there are also things, blessings that God, God gives, and he establishes a new life, and he establishes protection for Adam and Eve, and he gives them children, and, uh, and, and we see how that plays out. So there's the Adamic covenant, because God has, he has to take life, but 
he also gives the promise, and the biggest promise isn't that he would provide for them, that they would learn how to farm, that they would still be able to eat even though it was going to be really difficult, and they would still be able to have you know, children, although it was going to be incredibly painful. But he gives a, uh, the ultimate promise, and this is where the scarlet thread through the scriptures starts, is the shedding of blood to pay for their sin. But then there's a promise, and he gives Eve a promise, and he says, I am your seed is going to crush the head of the certain serpent. Jesus is promised in Genesis. From the very beginning, Jesus is promised in Genesis. This covenant promises redemption. The Noahic covenant, God promises restraint because the Noahic covenant is the flood, the flood happens, God floods the earth, kills everyone, minus the eight people on the boat and the animals, and then he puts the rainbow in the sky as he hangs his bow. It's, it's that word, we, you know, we look at the rainbow and we're like, oh, it's soft, pretty, cute, right? Like the word that's used is a warrior's bow, the most devastating range weapon that you could possibly have in antiquities. God hangs his bow up in the sky. It's like if you were, you're, you're retiring from football, Tom Brady hung up the cleats, right? He's not going to do it anymore. He already said the other week, Aaron Rodgers tore his Achilles last weekend, and Tom Brady said, I'm not coming out of retirement. I'm done. God hung up his bow, his warrior's weapon in the sky and says, I'll never destroy the earth like this. Again, I will never destroy humanity like this again. This is his covenant of restraint. Then there's the Abrahamic covenant. Um, God chooses, uh, a, he chooses Israel as his people. There's restoration. There's a plan to fix all of this, right? Not just a promise, which is what he gives Eve, but now there's a plan for restoration. And this is the coolest covenant, and I don't have much time, and I, I'm, I'm really gonna work on this. I'm gonna go real fast for you guys. But this is the coolest covenant because you wanna talk about the overt nature of covenant. God calls Abraham to, to get into this covenant with him, and, uh, and Abraham says yes, right? So God calls Abraham into a covenant that Abraham can't keep. Abraham knows he can't keep it, and Abraham says, okay. And so God says, get everything ready. So you, they, they, would, they, would, they would cut animals in half, and you would put the animals on uh, both sides of the aisle, basically. And then the two people would come, and you would do this for weddings. You would do this for legal uh, ceremonies. And, and, um, and it, you ever, in Scripture, it talks about they would be at the gate, and they would trade sandals as the contract. That's because when you would do this covenant, you would walk through the blood of the animals that are put out to the side of you, and then you would trade sandals. And you would have that sandal that was soaked in the blood that signified that you made a covenant that was unbreakable. And God waits, and it says that Abraham goes into a deep sleep, and then he has this vision, and God essentially makes this covenant with himself by himself, without Abraham. He makes it on Abraham's behalf, and if you look at the imagery, it's really cool stuff. It is literally God and Jesus making this covenant for Abraham, that Abraham knows that he cannot keep, and God knows he can't keep it, and God says, I'll take this one. I'll take this one. Jesus steps in and makes this covenant son with father and says, I will pay the price. I will walk through the blood. I will be this sacrifice. It's restoration. There's the Mosaic covenant, which God gives the law, right? The law tells everybody that we're dead and we failed and we can't live up to God's standard. And then there's the Palestinian uh, covenant, which is the return where God gives them a promised land. He says, this is going to be your land. And wherever your feet may fall with those blood soaked sandals, wherever your feet may fall, that is yours. That's the land that I'm going to give to you. Walk it because you have a place to return to always. This is your land. And then there's the Davidic covenant, uh, which is the rain, the covenant of rain that's in 2 Samuel. And he, he, God promises David that someone from your lineage will always be on the throne, which we see falls apart real quick in the earthly sense. Like right? there's David, Solomon, and then it all crumbles and falls apart from there. Uh, but Jesus, through his earthly father, his earthly adopted father is directly a descendant of King David. And Jesus, through his earthly mother, Mary, is directly descended from King David. Both of Jesus' earthly parents are descendants of this covenant, as well as his father, who is the heavenly father, who is the father of David. David is derived from David. The lineage of David is blessed by God, and Jesus comes from that lineage. And then there's the new covenant, and that covenant is about restoration. It's about salvation by grace 
through faith, and it is the covenant that we live in. It is a covenant that is not like the others because all the other covenants, again, there has to be death and shedding of blood, and God does not die in those covenants. And then we have this new covenant where Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, this is the new covenant that I make with you, that I will die on your behalf. He fulfills the Abrahamic covenant. He fulfills the Davidic covenant. He fulfills the Palestinian covenant because he is going to establish an earthly kingdom. He fulfills the Noahic covenant that we are no longer objects of God's wrath because Jesus took that for us. The Abrahamic covenant of redemption, the Edemic covenant, a covenant of rule. Every single one of these covenants is fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus says, I, re I give you regeneration. I breathe you back to life. You cross from death into life. And the whole framework of the entire Old Testament is the story of God creating covenants with Israel and then with us as, as the Gentiles and Israel in the new covenant and setting a framework that puts us in a position where we can receive Every blessing, even though we fail to be able to hold up our end of the deal. We are the vassals. We break the treaty daily when we sin. And yet, he still gives us the blessing because Jesus has already paid the price. The entire scriptures are based on that framework. That from the very beginning until the very end. It is based on the fully completed promise and plan and work of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read to you Jeremiah chapter 31, and we're going to leave. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. We read verse 30. We're going to read verse 31 through 34, and this is kind of a continuation. This is how I wanted to bookend it. It says this in verse 31. It says, not like the covenant I made with their fathers. We have a different covenant. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. Again, this is the covenant that... Everyone in Israel, every Hebrew had looked forward to the covenant that Jesus, we already know, looking back, hindsight, 2020, the covenant that Jesus fulfilled. It says, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. It is a declaration of Adonai, the Lord God. But this is the covenant that I will make with them. With the house of Israel after those days, it is a declaration of, again, the Lord God, Adonai, I will put my Torah, my law within them. We will know we have the Holy Spirit within us. And yes, I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer will each teach his neighbor or each his brother saying, no God, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, and is a declaration of the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, their sin I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun as light by day and fix the order of the moon, and the stars as light by night. Jesus did all that. He was the word. He is how God created was literally through Jesus. And who stirs up the seas so its waves roar, Lord God is his name. We are in covenant with the only covenant keeper that has ever existed. And we are in that covenant because he initiated it with us. He invited it, us into it. He provided for it. He paid the price. The blood has been spilled. And then he gives us the blessing. And I love the, the, the verse in the Old Testament. We know it as be still and know that I am God. The, the literal transit, translation of that is cease striving. Cease striving. He's already done it. He has done everything. That is the framework when you look through the Old Testament. They missed that a lot, right? They tried. They tried. They did this. They did that. They had to make sacrifices. It was part of the law. They were under law. We are under grace. We are under a new covenant, a covenant that says his spirit is in you. As a follower of Jesus, when you submit to him as Lord and Savior, his spirit, the very power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in you. And these covenants are fulfilled through him. And therefore we receive their blessing. 
Jesus is the central figure of the story, and he adopts us and gives us familial rights to come and step in and be a part of his family in a way that no one else ever could and in a way that no one else will ever be able to do. And it is eternally binding, and he does not break his covenants. And this is a covenant that he, the Father God, has made with Jesus, the Son, on our behalf. And all we have to do is stop rejecting it. That is what we live. That is the covenant that we live under. And that is the gospel. That's the good news that we go and we teach to others and preach to others. I'm gonna pray for you guys and then we're gonna leave. God, thank you so much for uh, tonight letting us be able to study this. God, I ask that, um, that hopefully that this would uh, sink in with us, God, that it would encourage and refresh our hearts. Yeah, that this would uh, maybe be a framework for how we read through the Old Testament, how we read through the scriptures, the New Testament. As we look at the Bible, we understand the Bible, that we would know that it, from, from front cover to back cover, it is explicitly and exclusively about you, about your son Jesus, and what he has done for us, and the covenants that you have put in place. God, help us to to truly live in those covenants and live in the blessing that you have poured out onto us. And together we would go and that we would share that and invite others into this covenant. Because you said that how will they ever know if they don't hear and how will they ever hear if there is no one that preaches to them. God, let us be the preachers that bring this covenant, the good news that Jesus has done it all to those around us that are lost. So Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right. Y'all are dismissed. Thank you guys. I I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that as much as I did because I loved it.